There have always been those who thought this exaltation of Christ's human nature could not take place. Sure, there are many clear passages of Scripture which describe it. There were some who said, so what? He speaks of the Valentinians, that's a particular early heretical group, Origen, the church father, actually denied the actuality of the substance of his human nature. Um, Then he lists the early refutations. I didn't do that in detail, but there's the page reference. And against these notions, the true church, on the basis of the word of God, has defended the fact that the substance, the essential attributes of Christ's human nature actually remained and were unimpaired. So, when Scripture predicates something about the body of Christ, which seems to be above or contrary to nature, (coughs) these people deny that these two can exist together. One, the reality of his human nature, and two, that the Logos operates in, with, and through the human nature in, in a way which is beyond, above, and even contrary to the properties of human nature. You can see where he's going with this. Okay? Um, and he gives examples. Subterfuges. Interpretations regarding Christ walking on the sea. Or coming to his disciples in the body when the doors of the room were locked. Um, Says Chemnitz, such interpretations are contrary to the details of the stories. Um, And they're at variance also with all of antiquity. Others escape the the text through alteration, aloesis, that's Zwingli, figures of speech. See where it's going? It's going to go toward the supper? All right. But we can understand these in a simple and correct sense. And he explicates Christ walking on the waves, even though bodies sink in water. Um, So the reality of Christ's human nature is not abolished, even if something happens which is not only above and beyond, but even contrary to the law of nature, laws of nature. Roman 2, from Scripture it's clear that God, by his omnipotence, can and does perform many things, such things, in other creatures contrary to the law and order of nature. Uh, And he lists the ass speaking to Balaam, the waters of the sea or of the Jordan gathered, the sun standing still, iron floating on water, fire which does not consume men in a furnace, Daniel, and so forth. What's he arguing? It's over on D on the next page. What insanity, therefore, to argue that the omnipotence of God while retaining the reality of the nature unimpaired, cannot do something when it wills to do so, which is above, beyond, and contrary to nature. And he does it in and with that body in which dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, Colossians 2.9. Insanity to argue that he can't do this. Then he talks about the sophistries of those who deny this, um, We'll speak only of Christ's divine nature, but not of his human. Um, And then the closing to that one. The reality of Christ's human nature does not reduce the divine omnipotence to so narrow or or confined that the Son of God, when he wills, cannot, in, with, and through his body, while still retaining the reality of its substance intact, do something which is above, beyond, or even contrary to the natural and usual conditions of the human body. That is, to put it very bluntly, you don't use Newton to judge risen Jesuses. Risen Jesuses do with their bodies what they want to do with their bodies. Um, And we do well to salute. That is, if he says, take and drink, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, our part is to salute, not to figure out some way around it. This, of course, is aimed at the reformed of his day. Uh, Calvin himself, probably, in the essay I referred to earlier. Roman 3. Question. What are those supernatural or counternatural things which, which we must believe and assert regarding the body of Christ because of the personal union? Very quickly deals with what he calls the opinions of the fanatics. So, uh, we would say uh, in, our, in that day it was Anabaptist, 
Today it's closer not to Baptist but to Pentecostal, uh, particularly direct revelations. Both Calvin and Luther were up against the Pentecostals of their day, only it was called Anabaptist. Anabaptist is literally again baptizers. Uh, uh, we want to baptize you. Uh, you're, when you were a baby, somebody sprinkled some water on your head and mumbled some mumbo jumbo, but we want to baptize you. Okay? Luther, by the way, was all in favor of immersion, even with infants. You can immerse infants in baptism. He thought it was a great idea because it matched Romans 6, buried with Christ into his death by baptism and raised again. Luther thought it was great until somebody started saying that unless you were immersed, you weren't baptized. And that was the end of that for Luther. But basically, he thought it was great until somebody did the contrary, even with babies. Anyway, okay, so the sophistries of the fanatics... Um, then B, the more rationalistically inclined. This is directed at Zwingli. And I think to, the, to some extent Calvin himself. The rationalistically inclined. Those who argue from the capacity of human thought or what human bodies can and cannot do, says Chemnitz, they cannot simply follow what the scripture text says. They immediately disagree with the meaning of the words, and they impose on them a more reasonable interpretation. Symbolizes, huh? Take and eat, this, is my bo uh, this uh, symbolizes my body, certainly Zwingli. This is what the whole debate at Marburg was about, Luther versus Zwingli. Um, I won't do the background on that again, but it was, it was uh, incumbent that Europe have had unified armed forces to defend the southern gates against the invasion uh, of the Turks. And um, it's hard for us to imagine, but you didn't serve as soldiers unless you'd talk some theology first. Uh, we don't think like that. If I had been in a B-17 you know, going in over Germany, and there was somebody Jewish in the rear turret, uh, machine gun turret, all I wanted, I don't care about his Jewish faith, I care how good a shot he is. Huh? Um, anyway, in the 16th century, you talked about this. All right, the one true, sure, firm, and infallible rule which will guard our faith and direct it so that it strays neither to the left nor to the right, the word of God. Quote, he, it's, it's reference to Jesus, he himself knows best and most certainly of all what and how much can take place in, with, and through the human nature while it still retains the reality of its substance. Another quote, when we have the testimony of Scripture, therefore, we must not fear that the reality of Christ's human nature will be abolished if we believe the scriptures. Don't worry. Just trust what it says. Sort of like an exercise in sola scriptura. You know? Just trust it. You're not going to lose a nature here. Okay? Follow the words and it's going to be okay. And it'll be okay even if what he is saying in a given instance is beyond, above, or contrary to nature. We must not be led away from the clear words of Scripture, quote, for he who has revealed his will to us in the word surely knows best what and how much he wills and can do in, with, and through the assumed body while leaving uh, its substance and reality. Okay, so, says Chemnitz, these are the arguments we should use based on the personal union. Huh? God can do even through a personal union of man and God in the Son, what he wills to do. And, says Chemnitz, we've already seen in the scriptures this sort of illustration with regard to other subjects. So, um, he uses as example that the flesh of Christ is actually life-giving. The text says so. Well, flesh isn't life-giving in the sense that we usually understand that, says Chemnitz. Well, this flesh is. Stay with it. Huh? 
that Christ is present at the same time both in heaven and in the supper when he says, this is my body, says Chemnitz, just trust the words as they stand. So then he sums up, um, the testimonies of Scripture concerning Christ's human nature are twofold. One, some testify as to his essential or natural properties, while others speak of two, those things which are added to the human nature beyond its natural properties, be, properties because of the hypostatic union. This is, shouldn't cause us to be on the horns of a dilemma. Just say Scripture says both and let it sit. And if somebody says, I can't put those together logically, Chemnitz would say, then wait till that eternal school and you will. Right now, just trust what it says. Now, aside here, little digression. Anybody to whom we're speaking has a right to say and will, what makes you think this book is above any other book? You're using it like word of God. But the Mormons use their books as that. Uh, the Muslim uses the Quran like that. You're just one of many that says, my book's correct and the others aren't. And he has a right to say, do you have any rationale for this? Now, the Lutherans have been marvelous on that the thing is true. In our last hundred years, we've been much weaker on giving a rationale for it, and it shows in the pastors. We haven't had it going on at seminary, so it isn't going on in the pastors. That simple. We haven't had apologetics taught really for a century. Um, we had a little exception to that the last five years with Dr. Francisco teaching at Fort Wayne, but that's over because we took him. Um, but... Uh, the the non-Christian or other kinds of Christians have every right to say to us, you seem to be always grounding what you're saying in texts. And the Lutheran says, yeah, we tend to do that. Um, well, uh, are you sure that the book itself, um, is there a rationale for using this book that way? Because it sounds like everybody else. They have their books or book. Now, I'm not going to digress on that. But uh, there's a particular tack I think we should take on that. Okay, digression over. Last section. We've now demonstrated by many arguments that the objection against the reality of Christ's human nature is when we have the word of God, not a valid one. And this, he says, ought to be held without ex exception. But scripture itself shows what confusions uh, human reason under the pre this pretext of the reality of Christ's human nature is wont to excite in the face of the clear word of Christ. Minds of unbelievers and even of believers. And he uses as an example Matthew 14, Christ walking on the waves. Mark 8, the miracle of the five loaves. John 20, Christ showing his risen body to Thomas. Luke 24, his appearance and disappearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> and his appearance to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, in which the text says, come over here, and he showed them his hands and his feet after his resurrection, because they were thinking ghost. I would have been too. Um, so, he uses all these examples to say, quote, you see how tenaciously, even the, in the, even the minds of the apostles themselves were possessed by arguments concerning the reality of Christ's human nature and against the things which Christ with his own voice attributed to his own body on the grounds that these things are above and contrary to reason. Okay? Chemnitz says, let the factual override the theoretical here. Or if you're in the sciences, inductive reasoning over the top of deductive reasoning. Let the individual facts override your great scheme. So much the worse for the scheme. The text itself will lead us to this. Chemnitz. We've cited these examples from the apostles themselves in order that we may be warned not to permit ourselves to be led away from the words of Scripture by thoughts and reasonings of this kind. For both the explanation and the refutation of such arguments have been shown and given to us by the Son of God himself in these accounts. Then another one. 
This consideration alone ought to cause pious minds not to allow themselves to be moved by fallacious arguments over the reality of Christ's human nature or to depart from the clear testimonies of God's word when it predicates something about the human nature of Christ which is above or contrary to nature. Even though, there's a typo, even though we cannot explain or understand how these things can be or how they can be done by the reality of the human nature. Okay? Again, let the facts override. Think of the Thomas account. Unless I put my finger into his hands, feel the wounds, unless I'm able to thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And in his grace, the Lord did exactly what Thomas was demanding. He was under no obligation to do it, but he did it anyway. And Thomas was on his face, and the highest confession of the whole Gospel of John is right there, my Lord and my God. That's the culmination of John's Gospel. There's some wonderful things in the close, but that's, if you're thinking drama, that's the culmination of the story. And we ought to be the same. That is, if we read an account where Christ in the body when the disciples are in a locked room, frightened, he appears to them in the body and says, Peace be unto you. Our position ought to be, Yes, sir. Not, Bodies can't go through oak doors. This is directed at the Reformed, I think. Okay? He says, You don't do that. Risen Jesus is do with their bodies what they will to do, and your job's to salute. Okay? Same argument again and again and again. And of course, it's to the supper. If he says, this is my body given into death for your sin, what's, what's your position and mine? Salute it. This is my blood, the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink. And our position is, yes, sir. Okay? All right, that's the substance of it. I'll throw it open for questions because I never want to hold you over. Um, you get the idea. Okay, Dan? You mentioned um, the importance of this in the 16th century for, for even going to, to battle. Yeah. And in talking uh, with, about this, these sorts of things today uh, with evangelicals who also have a very high view of Scripture, yep. Good. Th they'll say things like, yeah, that's 16th century. That's why do we really need to get into that? This is a, a new new day. Uh, you're convoluting things. That's that's 16th century. Leave it there. What do you do with that? I turn them to you. <laughs> well, really, we're in the field of history, and uh, many of the arguments that are brought up as arguments don't have much to them. If your overriding concern is what's true, and if God picked history as his vehicle and words as his vehicle, then you can sift out a lot of what Americans think are arguments because they're not worth the time of day. Now, I'm probably not the best guy to ask how would the dialogue go with somebody like that, but here we're not talking theology, we're talking history, and we're talking what used to be called critical thinking in the California schools. Um, Well-intended, badly executed, but um, the ability to think whether a proposition is true or not true, and what would count for it, and what would count against it, and how would you solve a question like that, uh, and is it worth even putting the energy into it, and so forth and so forth. And that'll vary with your audience. But that's what we're to here. And the fact that these things are out of date, only Americans really are stupid enough to bring that up because we're so captive to the sensate, the immediate, and what's going on now. And the rest of the world sees that for what it is. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is more kind of a comment on the Times and, and with a small question, uh, I, was, I saw O'Reilly the other night when he was kind of debating Bill Maher on uh, uh, Christianity. And O'Reilly, of course, being a Catholic, uh, 
he was pinned by Bill Maher on all of these points, on all the miracles of Christ, on, on the things that we were just discussing where you have opposing statements or opposing mm-hmm. facts. Mm-hmm. And, and O'Reilly immediately went to the fact that, oh, this is all allegories. This is what? Alle- allegories. And, you know, we would, you know, it's not necessarily true. It's just for our, um, to learn from, and it's all allegorical, and da 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 So at any rate... His priest should be slapped. <laughs> yeah. It was very embarrassing to see on, on you know, his, his... Of course, it could be O'Reilly just wasn't listening to his priest either. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? But at any rate, my point is, my question is, is, is that always incorrect to go to the when you're pinned like that, because this is what's happening to us today. Uh, sure. Bill, Bill Maher is, has this movie out that I forget the title of it, but it's, that's what, they're, sure. what, what they were talking sure. about, to make Christians look like fools. Sure. And, and uh, he's pretty good at it. Yep. But my question is, is that we're never to go to that allegory. We're just to say, no. we don't understand... When well, I'm, I'm assuming an apologetic background here that I just digressed on for a second. In other words, Christianity is wed to history in a way that most other religions are not. If you were to discover that your historical accounts of the Buddha came six centuries after he actually lived, and absolutely anything could have happened during that time, and you go to the Buddhist and say, I think your primary information on your leader is uh, at best weak and at worst mythical. The Buddhist isn't bothered at all. Why? Because the thing that makes it run is the teachings, the Eightfold Path. Christianity can't do that. There are a lot of liberal pastors who think it can, and they're just ill-educated. Christianity is dependent on certain things having taken place. And if they didn't, the foundation of Christianity crumbles. And I'll give you just one chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, which that's exactly what Paul is arguing. We are dependent on certain historical things. Now that pushes it back to, do we have good, solid historical accounts from eyewitnesses and the early people of what took place? The answer is overwhelmingly, yes, we do. And that's the way it should be argued. Um, There are places where, as we've seen through this course, he is very, very precise as to what's going on here, and it's backed up by miracle and fulfilled prophecy. If it isn't, I wouldn't be a Christian. In other words, if it has to do with the beauty of the Sermon on the Mount or something like that, count me out, thanks very much. I'll take sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now, others aren't as bent as I am, but I'll just say it flat out. Um, And I think I'm in line with the New Testament text itself. So if O'Reilly isn't even educated to know something enough to know something that basic, probably he ought not be on the affirmative side in the debate because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, if he'd been under a really orthodox priest and had attended and paid any attention, then he'd know better than what he did. But evidently he doesn't. Yeah, we have a lot who out there on the conservative side uh, who, when you get into this, it shows that the American knowledge of Christianity is about a 32nd of an inch thick. It's just laminated barely, like Formica, just barely onto a culture that uh, is clueless. And I I said something the other day about homeschooling and about uh, Orthodox Christian parishes, it, if things keep going the way they're going, we're going to be the monasteries where the last vestiges of thinking are going on. And people will want to get their kids into schools where they're trained to think. 
And I'll stop with that. Anyway, the case for Christianity. All right. I thank you for your attention. And next time we'll do 33 um, and we'll be done.